Yes, yes, that was now. Okay, let's start. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay. Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second of our um, Digital Futures Young's uh, presentations on uh, artificial intelligence. My name is Neil Leach. I'm one of the instigators of the Digital Futures Initiative along with Philip Yan. We started up uh, in, back in 2011. It's now in our, we're now in our 10th year. The purpose of these uh, Digital Future Young presentations is to give uh, young researchers, um, that's to say those recent graduates, PhD students and early career um, academics, a chance to show their work and to um, uh, share ideas. Um, uh, this is something that uh, we, we were doing when we were in, in Shanghai, when we actually were at a face-to-face -face operation and we continue it this year, uh, except we continue after the event itself, after Digital Futures World, um, um, the, 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 the whole event itself. Uh, so today is going to be the second of our presentations by um, uh, young researchers on the theme of artificial intelligence. Uh, before I introduce them, let me just say uh, a few things. A few there there are a few um, notices to make. Um, uh, next week we're going to actually shift the order in which we um, were intending to make these presentations. Uh, we were going to, we start off alphabetically with AI, but we decided we maybe should go into one of the most popular areas, uh, first of all, uh, to deal with computational design. And then after computational design, we will have robotic fabrication. Um, I suspect that we might have to have about two or three sessions on computational design uh, and we'll be sending out um, uh, um, a call for presentations very soon. Um, but we actually will be starting with the instructors, uh, first of all. So next Saturday, that's going to be um, August the, the 15th, um, we will have a session of the, uh, with the instructors from Digital Futures World. The other thing we're going to change is rather than have them talk about their workshops, we thought it maybe better to, to talk about their own research. So uh, next Saturday, same time, um, we, will, we will be kicking off with the, the computational design uh, uh, sessions with a session on the instructors uh, from Digital Futures World. The, every single week, um, every Saturday, at the same time, uh, it's seven o'clock, just on seven o'clock here in, in Venice Beach, California. It's uh, 10 o'clock in China, uh, 10 o'clock in New York, uh, four o'clock in the afternoon in Paris. Um, uh, um, we'll, be holding, we'll be holding these sessions. This is the one moment in, the, in the, the, the weekly schedule when most of the time zones overlap. So today we're delighted to have uh, five presentations um, um, from a range of presentations. I won't say anything about these presentations, and uh, I, I will. Uh, we, 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 I'll introduce them one by one, but I will not introduce the names. Um, we're going to start off with a with a, a group from the University of Michigan, um, who studied under Matthias Del Campo, Sandra Maniga, and Alexa Carlson. I should say that Alexa Carlson is also presenting today. I'm putting her on last because her work is uh, kind of high powered. Alexa is herself a, um, a computer scientist doing a PhD at the University of Michigan. So the first session we'll have, uh, we, we will do is um, with the, the team called uh, Adaptive Acoustic. Um, then uh, is Patrick here? Um, then we'll move on to Patrick uh, Dahane, um, uh, um, uh, Machine Aesthetics. Um, okay, so over to uh, the team from Michigan. Um, we have 12 minutes each to present. Um, and at the end, we'll have some questions for everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Tom, do you wanna, yeah. Okay. Um, morning and the evening, everybody. <laughs> it's seven o'clock here, so um, um, thank you all for having us. And our project is called Adaptive Acoustic. So my name is Yubei Son, I'm from Yumish. Uh, my name is Ying. Hi, my name is Maxim. Okay, so adaptive acoustic. According to Dowell and West report, artificial intelligence has three qualities, intentionality, intelligence, and adaptability. This is this project explored the adaptability of acoustic design in specific architecture. We are proposing a human AI collaborative design that will focus on creating spaces that alter and accentuate acoustic feature in architecture. 
So within our project, we'd like to explore the possibilities of how SAM can influence the spaces we design through the implementation of an AI-driven platform for architectural acoustic experimentation. Based on an initial data set of 2,000 concert hall interiors, our neural network will be trained to generate its own interpretation of acoustic spaces through the adaptation of existing volumes into acoustic forms. Our AI-driven device can be used to help influence early stages for concert halls uh, and music, acoustic music spaces. Through this process, we are poised to consider the opportunities for collaboration and shared authorship between ourselves and artificial intelligence. So let's start with the very beginning, our interest. Just picturing yourself sitting inside a golden hall in Vienna, and you can almost certain that you were here this. It's pretty less reverent, it's intricate music. However, if you're in a rock place like CGBG, and this is what you're expecting. <laughs> So it's not a lot of reverberation. It's pretty loud volume and the rhythm are intact. How about the Gothic church? It's going to be all long notes and they don't actually chant their key a lot. And then if you're going to open the arena for your favorite pop song it, singer, it's... it's a, yeah, it's basically just so, so, social situation. It's median tempo and the median speed balance. So we found out that many type of music just fit perfectly in specific architecture. So this is what architect, uh, what acoustic engineering does. So our goals here is to create a generator that can take in any input mesh volume, type in the acoustic parameters you want, and then our neural network will transfer it into a feasible acoustic mesh model. Um, so acoustic engineering is a relatively new and complex field. Um, there's the belief that the best sounding concert halls were designed and built over 100 years ago before acoustic engineering became a science. Some of the complexities that go into acoustical engineering today include reverberation, material properties, sound absorption, ornamentation, texture, as well as fine grain details and interior form. One thing that's important to note about our project is that we are only considering some select acoustic parameters and leaving out many others. Specifically, uh, we'll, be, we'll be focusing on quantifiable metrics that deal with spaciousness, interior envelope, and physical performance of sound waves within a space. In addition to this, we will also consider the, some non-quantifiable non architectural design elements, which are important to audience experience and performer condition. Reverberation time is our primary quantifiable metric, which allows us to train our neural network and is used to assess the sound quality of physical spaces. Reverberation time is a function of volume, surface area, and average material absorption coefficient. For acoustic music spaces, uh, such as concert halls, reverberation time should typically land between 1.8 and 2.2. So our method is to train a graph convolutional neural network to achieve our goal. First, we establish two databases. One is measures of concert hall interiors. The other is space and acoustic parameters, such as volume, reverberation time, acoustical area, absorption coefficient, and so on. We pair them up, and after the training process, we got a trained neural network. Then we run the optimization framework on the neural network and got AI-generated concert halls with acoustical features. Finally, we put concert halls into simulation software to, me to measure their feasibility. The internal process of graph CNN is when defining a convolutional for graphs. What it does is it calculates the weight of the given node's neighbors. It's aggregating features from its neighbors to recalculate its own features. So, if we regard the feature of the nodes of input meshes as x, y, z value and perform a convolution on these features, then on each node, we could get a feature vector and each node could be projected into a feature space and perform space features based on the nature neighborhood. With each graph convolutional layer that we added to the network, we can get more 3D information. For our dataset establishment, we use plans and sections from the book 
concert halls and opera houses by Leo Burnett to build meshes of the concert hall interior databases. These plans and sections also served as silhouette images of wax optimization and influence image of 2D scale transfers. Besides, we select a space and audio parameters from the book's chart to build the other databases. In order to be more accurate, we took the contour of plans and section interiors to make the data set models and control the match, match count of the database concert for into approximate 2000. Here is a display of our data set first and second data set. So the data set uh, tab displays the 100 orange models for the book concert halls and the opera houses and 2000 extensions models from the original 100. So for our final testing results, we want to test our neural network within a on neural site for concert hall and urban context. So we choose two sites, one for a small concert hall around 300 people and one for a big concert hall around 2000 people. And uh, scroll down, there are some uh, site dimensions and volumes that we use as another layer of input to our neural network. So within the input volume, the acoustic parameter, and maybe some silhouette images, we are ready to run the graph CNN. So those results are 44 results for our two sites. We use different shape of input meshes as well as different mesh counts, putting different acoustic parameters, including adjusting the volume number, the surface area, the reversion time, and also different lens ratio, etc. As you can see, some of them are really good results, but some are less functional. But I would say all of them are pretty inspiring. We found out that ellipse shapes make it easier for the network to reshape the output mesh. Here are two sides of each result model and the paired uh, simulation result from Ecotag. And then here Perfect. is, oh, you go ahead, Max. Uh, okay, yeah, further down we see um, 44 acoustic simulation re results. Um, the performance of sound waves is visualized through simulated particles. Um, so a range of results can be seen demonstrating how sound travels within our forms. And just by looking at some of the colors, you can sort of see which spaces are filled better with the sound, which spaces don't work so well. Uh, and from the testing results, we think further about how different parameters will influence the AI-generated concert hall forms. By using a control variety method, we draw the conclusion towards the ranking of impact factors. That is, mesh form, mesh count, and volume will have the greatest influences. Silhouette image, height, width, the ratio of length and width, the ratio of height and width take second place. Camera angles will also impact on the outcomes to some extent. States, revolution time, acoustical absorption area, volume per seat, and absorption coefficient have the last, least influence towards the results, as the slight differences they cause are hard to recognize directly. For these section drawings, we use another neural network called style transfer. We took the section cut from the result model and influenced it with the section drawings in the book, Concert Hall and Upper Houses. Those section drawings are what the neural network think the concert hall should look like, and we find those pretty interesting as well. So after perf performing acoustic calculations and simulating our output results, um, we found that there are certain inconsistencies between our desired input data and the simulated results of our outputs. The most obvious changes occur between the forms and the input um, of, of the input and the output mesh. Acoustic values tend to be linked but inconsistent between our desired inputs and our simulated outputs. Here we can see a range of successful and unsuccessful tests in regards to reverberation time and other acoustic parameters. Um, yeah, and further down we can um, we can see kind of what these uh, spaces start to look like through rendered images.
So uh, there are interior renderings that give a sense of how the concert hall generated by brass and works. Max, do you um, want to so how, yeah. So, however, um, showing much potential, our project is still in the, the early stages in terms of devising a complete acoustic solution for concert halls through an AI driven platform. Uh, the training of our neural network can be improved with the help of a more rigorous data set, which would include more detailed 3D models, material properties, associated values such as absorption coefficient for each material. Um, as it stands now, the platform exists somewhere on the line between um, early design and optimization, requiring additional human intervention to aid and com complete the design of the uh, call. We find that the AI driven platform to be useful in early stages of design, um, exposing us to a series of unexpected acoustic formal solutions that we may have never considered otherwise. Um, the possible sounds and qualities of these spaces captivate and inspire us and have the potential to connect to a wider culture of music, musical performance, and audience experience. So last but not least, we would like to take a minute to thank our thesis writer, Matthias and Sandra, also Alexa, who is here today, and Dinesh for their help. The thesis project is the first 3D to 3D neural network used in architecture, probably. This is a lot of research and cutting edge technologies involved. We couldn't do it without their help. So thank you guys. And if you're interested, uh, keep contact, uh, contact us and log into the website, so 3 www.adaptiveacoustic.com. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. I, I got some questions, but let's keep them till, till the end. Um, uh, let's move on to uh, um, to Patrick. Uh, Patrick Dahani from the University of Pennsylvania, UPenn. Hi, Patrick. Hey, um, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, I'm Patrick Dahani. Uh, I just finished up my MRC degree at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm currently a research assistant uh, with the Autonomous Manufacturing Lab there and a part-time lecturer uh, at the university. Um, so my focus in research has been primarily on generative adversarial networks and uh, ways of extracting mesh data uh, coupled with uh, like architectural scanning and surveying to construct layered data sets uh, to perform a kind of more complete analysis of uh, existing architectural precedents. Um, so I'll talk about a few di different aspects of the project today. So uh, I'll break it down into an initial collection, uh, which includes the architectural surveying, um, focused on the Art Nouveau, uh, and then a 2D training set, um, an image-based training set uh, to develop a kind of aesthetic character um, and and to uh, develop a, just an image-based uh, form of analysis and reading of the initial data set. Um, from there, I will talk about uh, the utilization of uh, some data processing from the initial 3D scan set in order to prepare it for uh, training still in 2D uh, generative adversarial network training sets, uh, but using uh, different data processing to get 3D results from it. Um, and then how conditional GANs can uh, free us from some of the rigidity that, uh, that we are limited by in, in those um, part four uh, proposals. And then part six uh, is the final design proposal and application of all of the layered machine learning. Um, so, like I said, I'm Patrick Danahy. Uh, my advisor for this thesis project was uh, Robert Stewart Smith, who I also work with um, in the robotics lab. Um, so, although this work focuses on uh, 2D generative adversarial networks moving towards 3D, uh, we're now working on real time robotics and computer vision, um, hoping to tie some of this work into future work soon. Um, so, 
a brief introduction of the project. Uh, it started with um, last year, I was fortunate to receive two travel grants um, and was able to travel through Europe uh, collecting architectural fragments, um, 3D scans of, of both uh, architectural details as well as um, ceramics and furniture pieces from the Art Nouveau period. Uh, I focus um, primarily in four locations, Brussels, Lille, Nancy, and Paris. Um, these locations represented uh, specific moments in the movement that uh, showed variation in scale, uh, approach, style, um, material. Um, so I thought that focusing on those four uh, utilized the similarities present within the Art Nouveau, um, but also allow for some divergence in the data set uh, to kind of allow more individual characteristics to develop. So the uh, base scan collection from Europe is around 140 meshes. Um, and you can see a few selected on the left. And then I was fortunate when I got back to get in contact with uh, a gallery in New York that uh, stores a um, collection of around two to 300 um, Art Nouveau ceramics. Um, including some work by Hector Guimard and uh, Ernst Boussier. Um, so on the right are a few selections from their scan collection. Um, so for anyone that's not familiar with uh, the photogrammetric process, it's uh, around 60 to 100 photos of uh, the object or fragment or detail uh, that you're capturing. The algorithm aligns and matches each of the photos and then recreates it in 3D space uh, and then retextures the mesh with uh, clippings from the image. So on the left are some of the uh, photo inputs and on the right is one of the 3D mesh um, scans. Uh, this is another example from the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, so some of these were within museums or behind glass uh, or just in the public. Um, I tried to scan as much as I could whenever I could. Um, so again, photos on the left and then the 3D mesh scan on the right. Um, so the Art Nouveau posed uh, a few interesting issues to me, which is why I ended up selecting it. Um, one, there's enough individual uh, kind of stylistic development, uh, especially in in the different cities uh, themselves. So that produces divergence that creates a uh, kind of robustness in the data set that avoids um, an immediate overfitting, um, especially as, as the numbers of the data set get larger. Um, in addition to that, there's uh, material explorations and experimentation that was occurring at the time, um, which again, allows for a more robust data set and a little bit of divergence in the outputs. Um, however, the formal characteristics tend to share a lot of similarities. So uh, the analysis can kind of be made across the um, movement despite some of those divergence. So uh, this is one of the scans from the Jason Jacques collection. On the left is the 3D mesh scan, and on the right are uh, rendered turntable views. So essentially reversing the photogrammetric process to get a clean uh, image representation of the 3D model. And this is just another example from uh, La Amphora, um, a ceramic from the Jason Jock collection. Uh, so the, the intention behind this was, although I had the 3D data, um, I knew that there was going to be some 2D training involved, so I was trying to supplement some of the photography um, detail images and the inputs for the photogrammetric process um, to build out a more robust data set that also includes um, objects in virtual space and not just uh, kind of full bleed detail images, um, not fully able to uh, extract the object. 
So this next step in the project um, is kind of the development of character or like the shared qualities in the aesthetic set. Uh, so after my review, we were very lucky to have Jane Bennett uh, on and uh, we were able to discuss kind of like the position of generative adversarial networks within her framework she's established uh, through vibrant matter and objects calling capacity, um, discussing kind of how generative adversarial networks may have an opportunity to uh, read these data sets, um, you know, precedent collections, stylistic collections in a way that is non-symbolic or not iconographic, um, which in the past, uh, Wolflin attempted to do through a sort of psychoanalytical method with the Baroque. Um, so I guess you could say this is kind of uh, my version for the Art Nouveau using machine learning to try to extract the data from its context and analyze it uh, among its uh, formal characteristics. Um, but I'm including textural characteristics as well. So for this, um, Part of the project, I use the StyleGAN 2 architecture. Originally, I was using a custom GAN uh, to train on 2D arrays that I developed with Keras. Um, but then in order to get higher resolution outputs, um, I ran uh, the StyleGAN 2 with TensorFlow, and I ran it on uh, Runway ML's remote GPU instances so that I could process uh, this training more efficiently. Um, so on the left is a few selected images from uh, a smaller 5,000 image data set, but I have a 5,000, 10,000, and 20,000 image data set, um, both a mixture of the rendered outputs of the scans, as well as detailed photographs um, on the left. And then on the right are the preliminary uh, 2D outputs from the style GAN um, training on these images. I, I think uh, this starts to show, I guess, like the, uh, the types of qualities, uh, shared qualities among the set that it does extract both formally, texturally, materially, uh, color. And, and you can start to see like uh, the things that kind of propagate throughout, throughout both the data set uh, as inputs as well as uh, their outputs. So since, since I extracted the scans and they uh, were able to exist in virtual space on white background, I had uh, a relatively large collection of extracted objects. So the data set uh, output contains uh, a decent amount of extracted objects uh, in the outputs. But uh, to me, it starts to become interesting when they kind of hybridized again with like the physical photography. So you get um, some reading of a background that didn't exist in the virtual space um, and, and the kind of extracted object quality that didn't exist in the physical space. And the negotiation of these like edges and uh, kind of textural qualities that, that develop, I think are, um, not directly indicative of some of the things present in the Art Nouveau, but there is a sort of kinship uh, that's developed uh, that is readable, I, I think, in terms of like textual qualities and, and some formal characteristics. So to go beyond this, since I have as a collected data set, uh, a collection of meshes, meshes obviously are 3D, uh, data, 3D, they exist in 3D space. Um, but I still wanted to maintain 2D training uh, for efficiency and so that I could train it locally if I ever uh, needed to. So I developed methods of uh, compressing the data down to 2D arrays to always train in 2D, but always uh, get 3D outputs and uh, 3D data inputs. For, for the training uh, sets. So I, I saw it as a uh, topological, a base topological uh, issue where in theory, uh, you can compress 3D data down to its base topology plus 
vector translation information. Uh, vector translation is just X, Y, Z, which uh, you can just remap to RGB values and then train on 2D arrays uh, within that domain as well. Um, so this is a diagram that kind of breaks down the process a little bit where there's a scan 3D mesh input um, Python scripts just to automate the importing, scaling, uh, 3D feature extraction uh, for edge detection and concavity, um, which then ties into vertex weighting. Um, and then uh, the input based topological mesh sphere is used uh, for a kind of manifold solid uh, topological base, which is fed into a closest point projection. So it projects inward to the scan uh, mesh as a solid. And uh, it is recursively tied with smoothing to avoid self intersections um, and then back to the projection smoothing, uh, always factoring the vertex weighting to align with uh, the edges to better capture the geometry. Once that process is over and it meets the distance threshold, it uh, is sent to a boundary first flattening and then the vector displacement output is uh, output. So this is a similar process, but instead of a manifold solid, uh, it's using planar relief uh, based topology. So um, same import uh, of the 3D mesh scan, same uh, 3D feature extraction and vertex weighting, but instead you have a base plane feeding into a spring system, which drapes over the mesh, and then a vacuform like setup that compresses based on uh, the inverse normals uh, until it meets a certain distance threshold and recursively is smoothing and uh, weighting the vertices to avoid self intersection and then is output to boundary first uh, flattening methods for vector displacement. So this is a uh, just visualization of some of that process where you have the scans on the left, uh, a general draping in the middle, and then the vector uh, display between the output drape mesh and the input base mesh plane. So uh, not only do you have the actual 3D data of the mesh, but you also have uh, different surface data. Um, you can uh, utilize different geometric analysis uh, to extract extra layers of information. Um, so one of these is uh, the textures and with these high resolution 3D mesh uh, scans, I have uh, a collection of high resolution texture outputs. So I wanted to uh, bring that back into the, the process as I uh, develop the kind of geometric approach further. Um, so another geometric analysis would be curvature maps um, and then inclination maps. So together you have the mesh 3D data, the texture output, curvature output, inclination output, and then vector displacement representation as a 2D array of the 3D information and an alpha of that uh, for later use with the conditional gains. Um, so this is just another example of one of the uh, collections of layers uh, within the data set. So from there, the issue that that kind of arose is that there is a topological rigidity to that. Um, you can't escape your base topology uh, with those methods. So uh, bringing in conditional GANs allows you to just correlate curvature maps with texture maps, uh, curvature maps with vector displacement maps, vector displacement alphas with vector displacement maps. So you start to break free from some of the rigidity present in those earlier examples. Uh, so for this, I'm using the pix to pix um, architecture with uh, running on TensorFlow. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, pix to pix is a conditional GAN that takes an A, B input and gives in, uh, then for training, it trains on A, B, uh, and then you give an A, B where A is the semantic label and B is the style uh, direction. 
and then it gives you a just a B result. Um, so one example of these sets uh, that I train pigs to pigs on, um, on the left you have of both columns, you have the inclination maps tied to the texture information. And then these are some of the results from uh, the pigs to pigs output. So on the left is still the semantic label from the inclination. On the right is the texture output uh, generated by the generative adversarial network. Um, similar, but this is using vector displacement alphas uh, and tying that to the actual vector displacement information. Um, this allows you to start to break down that topological rigidity. Um, so then these are some of the outputs um, where the input set is now shifting to uh, any, any boundary representation within the alpha and then can be uh, generated with new vector uh, displacement information within those bounds, and then mapped back on uh, whatever the base geometry is, and then displaced in 3D. Um, so you no longer have to rely on a base mesh sphere. Uh, so the final part of this project is kind of tying all of these things together, uh, taking each of the layers that were developed kind of independently, and starting to uh, create a more unified whole. So through a similar process um, that the data set of the Art Nouveau work was collected, uh, I scanned a few building fragments within Philadelphia uh, as kind of inputs to operate on. Um, so on the left is just a fragment of one of those scans. Um, so again, similar to the uh, Art Nouveau data set, this has the same information that can be extracted and then manipulated with the Art Nouveau set to push it more towards uh, the Art Nouveau data set. So using the conditional GANs, uh, the vector displacement maps are generated on the uh, scan fragment alphas. And on the left, you can see uh, the scan fragment, uh, which is a mesh solid translating in based on the vector displacement uh, generated map. Uh, and then this is just another fragment uh, also with a generative uh, vector displacement map. Um, so I mean, it's, it's not capturing all of the kind of uh, subtleties that are present in some of the uh, scans for the uh, data set, but it does do a, a decent job in getting general 3D um, translations as, as well as kind of building depth within the, the facade. In order to extend some of those local features and, and develop those further, um, I then extracted data from the uh, vector displaced uh, facades and, and extracted all of those same layers, including curvature maps. Um, I then used a style transfer network to translate the uh, curvature maps and inclination maps into um, kind of more detailed outputs to be used as displacements, uh, as well as supplemental texturing uh, to kind of assist the conditional GAN output. So this shows like a rough layout of the kind of layering of each of these steps where the building scan is on the left. It's broken down into fragments from that, an alpha map and a curvature map are extracted from each one. Uh, the alpha map is tied with the uh, conditional GAN, uh, the pix to pix model to develop the vector displacement map, which then generates new uh, building fragments. And then the curvature map is tied with the style transfer networks to develop uh, new texture maps and displacement maps for local detailing and uh, a more high resolution kind of output uh, correlating with the vector displacement geometry. Um, and then in order to just add a kind of scale and uh, like reference, I also included a bump map, so a brick bump map. So if you see that, that is why that is there. So these are two of the outputs um, without the conditional GAN material um, added onto it. 
So this is just the style transfer texturing uh, and displacement with the vector displacement output on uh, two of the building fragments. And then this set of images uh, is the conditional GAN texturing with uh, the style transfer adding displacement and uh, some texturing where the curvature um, is highest. So it happens kind of in the crevices and the, the understanding from my point was to kind of uh, accentuate depth and build as much depth into this out of these kind of layered machine learning methods as possible. Um, so where the curvature is being developed through the uh, vector displacement maps, you want to emphasize that with further kind of machine learning processes. Uh, and then it, it starts to kind of perpetuate the, the intrigue in those moments. So uh, like I said, uh, this is kind of where the project ended um, at that point, but I'm now working on uh, implementing some computer vision um, to add some extensions to the layers, as well as um, uh, working with Rob Stewart-Smith to extend into uh, kind of agent behavioral responses to these uh, kind of built up extracted data sets. Um, but the, the general approach to this project was developing an extended data set um, and, and training method that can look at multiple different aspects of uh, a kind of deep data set um, and, and get something that can resemble some shared qualities within that. Uh, so thank you for having me. Thanks, Patrick. Um... I should say that yeah, what, what we're discovering, I think, is that there are certain clusters of research to AI, um, and UPenn is one of those centers. Um, uh, Hao Zheng, uh, who also who taught a, um, a workshop on digital futures world, is doing his PhD on machine learning in, in UPenn. And Rob Stewart-Smith is probably familiar to many of you. Rob was the person who, who supervised this project. Uh, Rob initially was teaching at first the AA, then the Bartlett in London, and simply has recently moved uh, to UPenn and uh, um, is establishing a research center there. Um, let's move on to the uh, the next project, um, uh, Fernando Salcedo. Um, Fernando, I should say, was my student at the Florida International University. Uh, where we are also um, setting up a research center. We've got a, a DDES, a Doctorate of Design, uh, that starts in January, where we're going to be focusing um, especially on the, the theme of, of AI, um, among other computational subjects. Um, Fernando, are you there? Are you, are you muted? Um, Can hi, you hear me? Okay, over to you. Hi, how are you? Uh, Hello guys, my name is Fernando. Um, I just finished uh, my master thesis uh, this past April uh, with Neil Leach. Uh, the name of my project is called Deep Perception. And uh, the basic premise of this project uh, is to sort of uh, make uh, these tools more accessible to architects, uh, these deep learning models, uh, so they can use them uh, to leverage uh, their schematic uh, design concepts. Um, so some of the uh, Traditional methods for architects to come up with schematic concepts are usually just uh, 2D sketching, uh, 3D modeling, or building real physical models. And so um, my idea of this project was to sort of extend their abilities uh, through AI. And uh, the deep learning models that I chose, uh, similar to many of the students I just presented, are generative adversarial networks. Uh, for those of you guys that are not familiar with this type of network, uh, the main premise of this is that there are two separate neural networks that are pinned up against each other, and you have the generator and the discriminator. And the idea is that you feed uh, data set A and data set B to the generator, and the generator is, uh, will output, uh, will sort of try to translate data set B into data set A and vice versa. And the job of the discriminator is to identify wh whether the images generated uh, are real or fake, and it will give you a score between zero and one. The closer that it is to zero, the more real the image is. And so this will run thousands and, and, and thousands of times, and the generator over time will eventually get better to the point that the images that are generated are almost uh, 
sort of unidentifiable uh, to the real ones, and they're so, they're they're so close together uh, that the results can be uh, pretty pretty exciting. And I'll show you what it looks like in a second. Uh, but before uh, you run the data through this uh, network, uh, sort of the most important uh, part of this process is to prepare the data and to choose your data very carefully. Uh, because if your data is not optimized, uh, the outcome and the results are, are not going to be great. Um, so, like I said, this is an image-based process and is uh, purely a, a 2D-based approach. Uh, whenever you sort of start to find the images for your data set, you want to optimize them and distort them a little bit. Uh, so if you find an image with a certain resolution, uh, what I did was that I cropped it into a square uh, to sort of uh, simplify the process for the network. Um, after that, I lowered the resolution in order uh, to be able to run tests in a quicker way because it's a very computationally intensive process. And so the smaller your images are, the quicker you're able to iterate and run different tests. Um, after you do that, um, I used a Python library called Augmenter that allows you to perform thousands of transformations to images. Uh, and I did this because I didn't want the network to just simply memorize uh, the images. I wanted the network to actually learn the semantics of the architecture that I was uh, feeding the network. And so some of the transformations that were performed were sort of like vertical skewing and horizontal skewing, as well as distortion, mirroring, and some other ones. And this is an example of two different types of data sets that I used uh, to run some of my early experiments, just so I could actually understand what the network was doing. Uh, and the idea behind this is that I wanted to see how the network were, would sort of translate uh, the essence. Uh, on the left, you see here the uh, some images of buildings of downtown Miami. So I wanted to capture that essence. There's nothing really particularly uh, sort of interesting about these buildings, but they do have a sort of characteristics, uh, which is just like a modernist uh, sort of style. Uh, and then I wanted to see how that would translate uh, with a data set of waterfalls. And so I could understand how the network was behaving. And this is uh, a video of some of, of the process. And you can see here how the network is trying to translate the buildings into the waterfalls. And each epoch means that the network ran through the data set one time. Uh, th this is a data set of 5,000 images. Uh, it took about one hour for each epoch to run through. So uh, here you see epoch 20. That means that the network was running for 20 hours. And over time, it gets better and it starts to sort of understand um, the semantics and the essence of downtown Miami, and it will be able to translate it uh, to images of, of waterfalls. And I trained this on the cloud using Google Colab, which is a virtual notebook that Google gives you access to, and you can uh, train uh, deep learning models for free, uh, basically. And uh, it, it already comes with uh, pre-installed uh, deep learning libraries. Uh, such as CUDA and PyTorch and such. And I use PyTorch for this. And this is a uh, CycleGAN uh, type of uh, generative adv um, adversarial network. And and sort of uh, the, the final result uh, for my project uh, was creating this interface um, for architects. And in this case, I just used my wardrobe, but it could actually be anything. And the idea is that the architects would be able to use a webcam and in real time uh, be able to use this deep learning model uh, to leverage uh, their abilities to, to be able to come up with schematic concepts uh, instead of uh, just purely sketching or building models and, and that sort of thing.
All right. And yeah, that's my project. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Fernando. Um, I personally found this project fascinating because uh, Fernando's wardrobe gets turned into architecture. His, his tie becoming a, a tower block is very interesting. I, I, if anyone's interested in what I make of it, there's, there is a lecture, um, a part of the, the intelligence series of Digital Futures World, that, uh, uh, the, the theory workshop that is, that is uploaded onto the YouTube um, uh, um, library. Um, to my mind, it's completely fascinating and says a lot, a lot about how we are trained as architects to see the world in a certain way. I should also mention actually that uh, um, also involved in the project was Daniel Bolojan. Daniel Bolojan um, has, was a um, visiting professor at FIU, Florida International University. He's now moved to Florida Atlantic University, which is just up the road. And yesterday he had a review of his work. Uh, Daniel Bolojan was um, an essential part of our team for Digital Futures World. He was the one who wrote the script to automate the whole um, uh, registration process. Um, so um, another place where uh, there has been a lot of work being done over the last uh, two or three years at, in AI and machine learning um, uh, is, is uh, LA. Uh, um, both SIARC and UCLA, Guvench Ozil has been um, leading the charge as it were within the ideas campus at um, uh, UCLA. So I'd like to invite um, uh, Wei Shi and the Wei, did I pronounce that right? Um, and the team from UCLA to present the project that uh, they did with um, Guven Josel. Are you there, guys? Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you see this room? Yes. Um, good morning and good evening, everyone. My name is Wei, and our team members, um, Xiaomai and Huiling, we are Growth Data Center City from Ideas Technology Studio. Um, before we begin, I want to mention our format. We have uh, about 10 minutes presentation and a uh, two minutes video, and our studio has also made an iOS app named Tech Studio XR, including some brief introduction, 360 views, our movies, um, augmented reality, and uh, we will also show some record of this app later. Um, so Data Center City proposes a brand new urban development in Greenland designed to store and maintain the world's entire data in 2050. And although anthropogenic climate change will result with the melting of the Arctic ice cap, especially in the uh, coastal area, um, the temperature in Greenland will remain cold, creating a natural environment that can accommodate for the massive cooling demand of data center equipment through sustainable use of wind and water. And the uh, urban lay uh, layout proposes zoomed approaches towards machines and humans separately in order to cater to their uh, unique climate-related demands. We selected the uh, south part of the uh, Greenland because of the uh, climate and the transportation condition. And also the wind um, speed in that site is uh, in 2050 is predicted to be over 40 kilometers per hour. And we used uh, machine learning to predict the future landscape in this area. This picture is the original landscape. And from these two videos, uh, we can see how the climate would be in the future and there would be less ice and more melted water ponds, which can be used for energy generation and water cooling. And also the demand of the data storage is increasing as time goes. In 2050, there will be more than 50 youth byte data to store and more than 250 data centers would be built to store most of the data. 
and uh, data would be transported by the global submarine cable network from Greenland to all over the world. Um, then we referred to the layout of the motherboard and used the same logic to design the transportation system as well as some function distribution. The red color is the data center rear. The direction of the data centers follow the wind direction. So it can make better use of wind. And the blue color is the office area and the, the pink and purple color is the residential area. Uh, so there is a clear divide between the uh, data center and the residential area. The office area with mostly high rise buildings in the middle is designed like a wall in the uh, center of the city to block the wind and the temperature in the east part would be heated by um, data centers. So the residential area would be suitable for him living. Um, then we used uh, pix to pix which allows us to design layout and create a photorealistic image. It, um, it can learn the mapping from the input image to the output image. We demonstrate that the, this approach is effective at synthesizing photos from labor maps. Since there are six main functions in our city, we used six colors for color mapping. For example, the red color uh, represents data center. So during this uh, machine learning process, the computer learns how to translate certain color to certain pattern and keep this process in its mind. So when we use our own label maps as input, uh, we will get the design map of the future Greenland. The left parts are the training data sets, mostly um, top views of um, existing data centers and the cities and the, their uh, labels. And the right bottom corner uh, shows the process from the input to the output image. Um, this is the label maps and the final result. And then we uh, think about the typology of the uh, future data center plans. To maximize the use of wind, we choose the streamline shape with the least drag coefficient and make series of um, aperture on the surface to let wind come in. And then we install cooling wind and water pipes accordingly. We also arrange the data centers in a stacked way to lessen the loss of the wind energy. The distance between one and another is calculated in CFD software. Um, here, is, uh, here is a record of our AR, uh, the inside structure of the data center individual. Um, and here is the data center view of the city. It consists of data centers and uh, auxiliary facilities, and they are only for the machines and robots. This is a 360 view of the data center machine rooms. And here is the office area of the city, including control center, office building, and energy serving station. This is a 360 view of the data center and office area. Um, this is the, also the uh, residential area. And our city um, has four levels in the vertical direction, the drone in the sky, elevated cable system, the buildings on the ground, and also roads for people and vehicle. This uh, video shows the explosion diagram of our city. Um, you can see the window is uh, blocked by the office area. And uh, um, this is a brief introduction and the layout of our um, iOS app, including six parts. You can scan this code and uh, download it. Um, then we made a movie in Unreal Engine to introduce the operating mechanism of our data center city. Um, our team member has sent the YouTube link to uh, in the chat, so please free to um, watch it. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, is, did, which chat did you put the the link? Um, is it the uh, Billy Billy? Um, um, I, both YouTube and Billy Billy link. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
So for our, our final presentation today, we have Alexa Carlson. Alexa, importantly, is not, is not an architect. She's a computer science uh, PhD student at the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan is well known for, for, for um, computer science. Um, John Holland, the great John Holland, who I think was the first ever PhD in, in, in computation uh, in the world was, was based in Michigan. Um, and she has been collaborating with uh, Matthias Del Campo and Sandra Manninger in the School of Architecture over the past uh, couple of years with a series of projects um, uh, looking in, into AI. Alexa, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, over to you. Awesome, I will share my screen. Let me... Awesome, uh, every, my screen, everyone can see it. Yes. Awesome, okay, I just wanted to check to make sure. Um, so hello everyone, uh, my name hello. is Alexander Carlson. Um, I go by Alexa, funny enough, and I'm a, as Neil said, I'm a PhD student in robotics and computer vision at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, the design projects I'm presenting today were done as part of a collaboration uh, between myself, Matthias, uh, and Sandra from the uh, University of Michigan Taubman School of Design. And, each of these projects began as experiments in applying deep learning to architectural projects in the Arch plus AI thesis studio that the three of us have been co-teaching for the past several years. Um, and so here's our presentation overview for today. Um, I'm going to be covering uh, the following projects and we'll briefly discuss our uh, future and current work. So um, first I'm gonna discuss our motivation for um, using neural networks uh, as design tools. Uh, so neural networks are a family of hyperparametric functions that are very loosely inspired by the human visual cortex. They are composed of feature extraction units called neurons that are grouped into information processing modules called layers. This mathematical structure allows uh, these algorithms to learn powerful models and representations of the real world. Uh, to apply these kinds of algorithms to design, we need to assess them on their ability to generate solutions that are both pragmatic as well as creative. Um, and the harder problem of the two, creativity, has typically been considered a human one. And the question of whether, question of whether or not an algorithm possesses this ability uh, is being extensively explored. Um, so as you know, defined by Margaret Bowden, who is a veteran AI and cognitive science uh, scientist, a creative idea is one which is novel, surprising, and valuable. But novel has two importantly different senses here. The idea may be novel with respect only to the mind of the individual or the AI system concerned, or so far as we know, to the whole of previous history. We argue that neural networks can uniquely contribute to the development of creative design methods because these systems are able to ingest and learn from millions of images that can span cultural and historical dimensions that would take a human or group of humans a lifetime to synthesize and learn. This means that neural networks are potentially capable of generating solutions that could combine either unique patterns within a particular cultural and historical context that a human might not detect, or that they would be able to create planned solutions that combine patterns from different contexts without the influence of human personality or emotion. This observation motivates our experimentation with methodologies that partner humans and neural networks in a collaborative design process, the output of which is a synthetic ecology that is present somewhere between the natural and artificial. So this brings us uh, to our first project, Hallucinating Cities. So for this project, we focus on the map, which is an icon of urban planning. It represents a vast collection of possible solutions and strategies for the materialization of symbolic information. In this project, we present an application of a neural network-based image editing technique called neural style transfer, which uh, was first presented by Leon Gaddis and has been popularized by Google's Deep Style web GUI. It is a tool that transfers the style of one image onto the scene geometry of another image using the learned fe feature representations of neural networks. We hypothesize that we can use this tool to extract and quantify symbolic structures like roads and buildings as textures that are captured in the pixel patterns of urban maps. Furthermore, these city textures can be combined and transferred to create novel topologies that are independent of the ways that we as humans typically see cities and landscapes. 
In the neural style transfer process, the learned representations of neural networks are used to disentangle style and texture from scene structure, um, which are typically highly correlated in pixel space. To better understand how disentangling and thus transfer is accomplished, we will step through how images are processed by trained neural networks. So each neuron in a neural network learns to extract visual features from its input, and each layer of the neural network transforms its input into a new representation based upon the features extracted by neurons within that layer. It's important to note though that the uh, learned features that neurons uh, extract are directly learned from image data during the training process. We as engineers do not specify what these features should be beforehand. And so sometimes these learned features will make sense to us as humans and we can recognize them. And other times they are alien and we don't understand them. So, uh, for example, let's just say we can understand the learned features uh, and we will uh, consider a neuron in the first layer of a network um, that could learn to detect very low level textual feature features like vertical edges. Um, and thus, given this neuron's uh, learned features, the first network layer transforms the image from its starting pixel representation into a vertical edge representation. Each layer of the network extracts more and more complex hierarchical features like co-occurring edges cor or you know, corners and colors to co-occurring shapes and colors to co-occurring objects, which it then uses to make its final prediction. So we can use trained neural networks to project images into texture representations that are captured by the first uh, few network layers as a way to quantify the image style. Similarly, we can project images into the shape representations captured by the later layers of the network to quantify scene structure. Thus, to transfer texture between images, we can manipulate the pixel intensities of an input image such that its texture representation in the network matches that of a different image without changing the original input image's overall scene structure. Thus, we can use this image editing technique to probe what the atom or a texton of a city is without the influence of human priors, i.e. educational, cultural, political, social, and economic influences. Namely, we can explore the ability of neural networks to develop morphologies of architecture that are divorced from human agency. In the left example on the slide, a city map is generated by transferring the style of the moon landscape onto a NOLI map of Washington, DC. Conversely, on the right side of the slide, we show an example where we have transferred the style of the same Washington, DC NOLI map onto the surface of the moon, thus populating a barren landscape with buildings and other city features. Here are some more examples of our experiments transferring topographical maps onto the streets of Florence to create new landscapes. And here are some examples of transferring Venice onto the moon and Mount Rainier to create new city maps. We also performed experiments in style transfer to see if we could generate novel building floor plans, uh, which brings us to our next project, which we have called Imaginary Plans. In this project, we wanted to transition from modeling texture and structure in single images to modeling the style and structure across, uh, captured across data sets of image. And uh, this desire motivated our choice to use a special kind of neural network, uh, which uh, other presentations have discussed, called, uh, called Generative Adversarial Neural Networks, or GANs. So just at a very high level, because I know um, this has been uh, described before, uh, GANs are composed of two neural networks, a generator network and a discriminator network. The generator network renders synthetic images and the discriminator network evaluates these images by comparing the rendered images to real images in the training data set. The generator's objective is to fool the discriminator by producing images that appear to have come from the set of real images. The discriminator, conversely, tries to detect pixel patterns within the rendered images that do not occur in real images. And so with this adversarial training strategy, the generator learns the space of real world visual features that occur over all of the possible images in the data set. And um, it then can sample from this space to generate novel photorealistic images that trick the discriminator. 
to generate floor plan designs that capture a fusion of architectural and artistic styles, we designed a data set of images that capture traditional features we wanted in floor plans, such as walls and rooms, as well as images that capture desired artistic and stylistic features that we wanted to be incorporated into the floor plan designs. The data set we collected contained several thousand images whose content span the range of standard floor plans, topographical maps, city and satellite maps, as well as abstract architecture and art, examples of which are shown on the slide. When a GAN is trained on this specially curated data set, it learns the textual, color, and geometric properties that connect and define the visual space between these images in the data set. In effect, the trained GAN can be used to generate unseen and unique floor plans that capture the stylistic elements from the non-floor plan images in our data set, as well as the structural features from the traditional floor plans. And the results from this process are quite intriguing. Using this technique, we can blend features together to create a dynamic style that captures and reflects the emergence of new beliefs, ideas, materials, and technology that might not necessarily be captured in traditional floor plans. Style artifacts can be exaggerated to the point of hyperbole, transforming the natural balance and harmony of human style and design into a periodolic and compositionally unstable, but novel form rooted in non-human visual features. This technique can actually be applied to combine data sets of uh, images that contain much more subtle symbolic style differences, such as modern and Baroque floor plans. What the network ends up generating are floor plans whose backbone and DNA is modern, but with Baroque musculature. The generated plans combine voluptuousness, the thickness of Baroque materiality with the asymmetry, openness, and rationality of a modern floor plan, resulting in hybrid conditions. So at this point in our experimentation, we wanted to investigate how we could move neural-based style transfer processes from 2D into 3D, which brings us to our next project, which we have called Machine Hallucinations. So this project's primary focus is to explore ways uh, in which 2D neural style and shape transfer techniques can be used to enact edits to 3D objects and representations like meshes and depth maps. The proof of concept project for this method, uh, the development of these methods is the robot garden, which is shown on the slide. The robot garden is designed as a future test ground for bipedal and quadrupedal robots for the robotics department of the University of Michigan. Part of the challenge of this project consisted in designing various ground conditions and complexities that robots have to overcome, such as stairs, ditches, boulders, and varying ground surfaces and textures. Our first experiments involved analyzing satellite images of the provided site using neural style transfer in RGB space, then trying different ways to project this site style onto a rendered aerial view of the, 3B, uh, the 3D robot garden model. The most successful technique, the output of which is shown in the figure on the slide, performs neural style transfer between satellite images of the robot garden site taken from different years over the past decade to generate a 3D ground texture, which is then used as a surface displacement for bump mapping on the 3D site model, resulting in very alien sculptural features. While this process yielded unique and captivating, the result, captivating results, the resulting model could not be easily constructed. And this fact motivated our choice to blend human design of the overall site structure um, and insert network designed objects within the site. In fact, uh, our most successful design experiments uh, revolved around designing these obstacles, specifically boulders. So to generate novel boulders for this site, we applied a similar technique as the one discussed in the previous slide uh, to generating 3D boulder surface textures. We used neural style transfer between binary black and white fractal silhouettes and boulder depth maps to extrude away parts of the depth map. The resulting style extruded depth images were then used to simulate surface displacement on the original 3D mesh of the boulders. Examples of the output of this technique are given in the figures on the slide. And now we show um, a render of the complete site with the AI and human design boulders in place, as well as little models of both humans and robots uh, using the space concurrently. 
So while we can get interesting uh, and very pleasing results using 2D to 3D methods uh, for style transfer, there are still some significant problems with them. Uh, the primary one being that the results of these methods are not constrained by the physical construction process, which means that the user or designer needs to modify the output, usually significantly, to bring these de design solutions into reality. This motivates us uh, in our current and future work uh, which is exploring ways to perform physically based and stylistic deformations to objects in pure 3D. So uh, conventional neural networks, which are kind of the ones that we have been discussing so far in the presentation, are designed to operate on regular grids, i.e. pixel arrays or images. But 3D objects like meshes have highly non-regular topologies that can significantly vary in terms of number of vertices, number of faces, et cetera. There are a novel family of neural networks called graph convolutional neural networks um, that are attractive candidates for developing pure 3D editing techniques because they can operate on non-regular data structures. And what's cool is that these networks are trained in a similar way and for similar tasks as our conventional 2D neural networks. So in a graph convolutional neural network, each neuron searches for local 3D features in vertex neighborhoods in its input and each layer of the graph convolutional neural network transforms its 3D input into a new representation based upon these extracted 3D features. This opens up a whole world of possibilities for design and 3D editing techniques. The most natural first step is to use the learned features of a trained graph uh, neural network to analyze the 3D texture of an input mesh object to perform 3D neural style transfer or to quantify semantic parts or substructures of input meshes and transfer these substructures um, and features onto other mesh objects. Um, so I am not going to show any examples of this process because um, we are actually currently submitting a paper uh, about this technique, but keep your eye out for it. Um, but what's cool is so you all have already seen uh, a really amazing example, um, an application of our studio's work with graph convolutional neural nets in the first presentation today, the Adaptive Acoustics Project. The team used their database of building interiors and corresponding acoustic parameters to train a graph convolutional neural network to learn the mapping between 3D model interiors and acoustic properties, which is a highly nonlinear and hard to model function with conventional mathematics. After they verified that this trained network could accurately predict the acoustics of interiors, we placed it into an optimization framework, which is shown on the slide. The key thing to take away from this framework is that it demonstrates the possibility of enforcing both physical constraints into the design process, i.e. using the graph convolutional neural network with um, a, an acoustic quality, uh, acoustic quality requirement, as well as stylistic and creative constraints, which we introduced through the rendered silhouette uh, requirement as well. So in conclusion, with each of these projects, we have taken the steps to assess neural networks ability to create realistic, pragmatic engineering solutions that are also creative and novel. Through these experiments, we have just scratched the surface though of post-human design methodologies. And we are on our way to demonstrating that neural networks can in fact be used to analyze mood, morphology, and styles as ways that we as humans might not be able to achieve. Our ultimate goal with these projects and with our current slash future work that we conduct in our studio is to develop complete design tools that encompass both of these facets. Um, and we want these tools ultimately to challenge the way we understand aesthetics and architectural design. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. And if you have any questions about any of the methods that I really briefly discussed in today's uh, presentation, please feel free to contact me. Um, and just as kind of a little pitch for our studio, if you're interested in doing work in this area and collaborating on these kinds of projects, um, I recommend checking out, uh, checking out our studio, uh, which you can also uh, contact myself or Matthias or Sandra about. Thank you again. Thanks, Alexa. Um, I should just mention that, uh, uh, th I mean, 3D, for those of you who've been working on, in AI is, is the big challenge, right, in AI. And uh, one of the tools that has been developed PyTorch 3D um, was actually developed by one of the, the current faculty in the um, Ed Michigan Computer Science Department. I also just want to mention because um, 
you touched on this, um, Margaret Bowden. Um, uh, Margaret Bowden is the grand old lady of AI and cognitive science. Um, uh, um, and uh, she's also a colleague, I should say, of uh, Andy Clark, uh, the University of Sussex. Andy Clark um, came to the Digital Futures last year. And she's a colleague also of Anil Seth, um, the neuroscientist who works on computational neuroscience, um, who took part in this year's Digital Futures World. And just to mention, uh, at uh, FIU, I get my students to look at Margaret Bowden's book, um, uh, which is one of the best introductions to AI. AI, it's nature and future. It's not about architecture as such. It's a straight AI, but extremely useful and, and clear. The other one I'd mention is uh, Melanie Mitchell, um, who is actually herself a graduate and has a PhD from the University of Michigan in Computer Science. Artificial Intelligence, a, a, a Guide for Thinking Humans. These are the two books that I'd recommend if someone wants to get some general introduction into an AI um, in, in general. Um, so, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna open up some questions in a moment. Um, we uh, have uh, three possible sites of questions. We've got a, a Zoom um, uh, platform going at the moment. We've got a Billy Billy uh, uh, live streaming platform. We've also got um, a YouTube platform. If you could uh, send your messages to those platforms and we can relay them to the, to the speakers. Um, before we start though with the questions, I want to just briefly um, uh, ask three of our new um, members of the committee, of the Digital Futures Young Committee, to say a few words to introduce themselves. Last week, those of you who were here, um, you, you were introduced to um, uh, the other members of the committee, but we have uh, uh, Theodore who wasn't able to come last week and also two new members, um, Nick Bow and um, uh, Sina Mustafavi. So maybe uh, Theodore, you could just say a couple of sentences saying who you are and introduce yourself to uh, our audience. Sure, thank you, Neil. Hi, uh, I'm Theodore and I'm a design Currently, a design technologist working on the City Intelligence Lab of the Austrian Institute of Technology, where I'm, I work on developing uh, urban design tools, mostly uh, utilizing artificial intelligence and deep learning uh, in order to enable real-time ur uh, urban design and performance assessment. So that's kind of my current application and my, my passion for the last five years has been to think of the intersection between architecture and engineering and machine learning. So I'm very happy to be here and it was great yeah. listening to this presentation. Okay, sorry, thank you. Okay, uh, can we, uh, thank you, Theodore. Um, Nick Bao, would you like to, oh, oh Sina, Sina, here you go. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Sina Mustafari from uh, TU Delft. I've been a manager in the uh, robotic building lab in TU Delft, and I've been also teaching and conducting a studio and interdisciplinary project in the Saon Institute of Architecture in Germany. And I'm also founder and principal uh, at Setup Architecture. Great. Thanks, Sina. And my, my, my main uh, area of interest and uh, uh, research is on uh, robotic materialization and computation and so on. I just said I used to teach in Dessau myself. Also, Matthias taught there, um, and uh, we have actually one of our Digital Futures World uh, instructors, um, uh, Shabin Youssef, was a student there a few years ago. Um, thanks, Sina. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nick Bao, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Yep. Hi, hi guys. Um, yeah, I'm Nick. I'm, I'm a PhD candidate at MIT University, and I'm also a design studio leader at MIT Architecture. Um, my research uh, is focusing on the structure optimization, multi-agent system, and the robotic fabrication. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, join um, Digital Future Young. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Nick. Nick was also was, was teaching a workshop with, um, with Mike Shi um, uh, um, in Digital Futures World um, using Amoeba, which is the software which uh, Mike Shi has developed. Um, okay, so uh, we can have some questions um, now. So please send your questions in um, onto the, the chat channel, onto the, 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 onto the chat. Um, maybe I can just kick something, kick it off um, to begin with. Um, I wanted to ask actually the first uh, group, uh, the Michigan, Team Michigan, um, about uh, the Adaptive Acoustic Project. Um, I, I, one thing I would say is when I was a student at the University of Cambridge, we had a... Um, I remember my acoustics uh, lecture and uh, lectures, and uh, uh, 
the professor was telling us that the perfect shape for a, an auditorium was a shoebox, um, <laughs> which was, to my mind was very disappointing in some senses. Um, I, it was, I was thinking about the Sydney Opera House and things, and I was told that a, a rectangular shoebox um, was the perfect shape. Now, what was interesting about the proposals that we, we saw just now um, was, was that they, they, they weren't shoeboxes at all. Um, but my question really is, uh, is, is to the team is what would happen if your program produced a shoebox? If it told you that the ideal form was an acoustic one? Because what was kind of interesting was the kind of the, the tension going on between the visual, uh, the very kind of rich visual vocabulary that you were generating um, and the acoustic performance of the space itself. Um, and they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily map, they're not the same thing at all. Um, what would happen if acoustically uh, AI was telling you that a shoebox would be the best solution? Um, so does anyone from the team uh, from uh, University of Michigan, uh, Adaptive Acoustic, want to respond to that? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I think um, I think there's the tension that you're talking about um, is is um, it would be interesting to, to, to see that if if, if um, a shoebox was produced, of course you can't argue with like uh, the the simulated results. But I think um, what our project was also looking at was um, kind of the uh, performer conditions as well as the audience conditions and how they experience the space. So there are like other architectural elements um, that don't always that don't necessarily um, uh, aren't necessarily related to pure um, pure sound that are part of the space which we found interesting and um, this was mentioned a little bit more in uh, Alexa's presentation um, we had uh, an additional input in our neural network which allowed us to um, play with the design uh, of the final form a little bit more by introducing a silhouette for our desired shape. So there's this additional tension that is uh, embedded into the neural network where we tell the neural network, well, we don't, maybe we don't want a shoebox. Maybe we want something that's more irregular. So then the, the neural network is forced to kind of um, work within that space where we tell it, you know, maybe a shoebox isn't what we want so it, it'll it'll have to work to produce the best possible solution for the parameters that we give it so there's a little bit of a little bit more input that we or a little bit more authorship that we're able to um, input into the design which may not produce the optimal shoebox but it will produce something a little bit more curated um, maybe my teammates might want to might want to add something else to that I'm not sure I would just want to say that we are also very surprised with the outcome. Uh, we didn't really expect it become that like dramatic. And um, probably the reason why it's not like a very um, uh, like symmetrical shoebox shape is because like the detail and all the material part also plays a lot in acoustic engineering. And then in our design, we didn't actually have like all the prepared material, uh, like coefficient number in it. So it's probably one of the reason why it's not like a shoebox right now. Um, but like, yeah, you definitely can try putting different material and it will give you like totally different outcome. Like you can just putting like concrete or like glass even maybe just trying to like try, try different things. So it, the outcome will be totally different than like the wood, like which is mainly used right now. Uh, I think another reason that uh, it tests the result now we see is also because we have a variety of the input, the 2000 mesh uh, forms. They Some of them, they come from the shoebox shape and the others, because uh, not only the shoebox will lead to uh, good uh, acoustical results. So we also like to use the other shapes as the input. And I think the input meshes, it also account for a reason that why the uh, output looks uh, so uh, dramatic. 
Great, thank you. I should just say what was behind that, that, that question was a, um, a question about, I think it came up about eight years ago, a lecture that was given by Roland Snooks, who of course was the uh, partner of Rob Stuart Smith, who was Patrick's um, supervisor in Kukuja. Um, and the question came from uh, Nick Pisca. Nick Pisca um, wrote a book on Mel scripting, uh, Meyer Embedded Language, Mel scripting, and he was working for Gary Technologies at the time. And his question was, what happened if your script would produce the, the Farnsworth house? And Roland's response, which was kind of interesting, was, well, that would be an unfortunate outcome, by which he probably meant that he was going to go and tweak the script until it did produce something that was visually attractive. Um, so I won't say anything about that, but that's my sneaking suspicion is that kind of you guys were looking for something that was visually attractive as opposed to be acoustically attractive. Um, but anyway, um, uh, so, okay, let's, uh, let's open up some questions from, from the audience, um, both from Zoom here and also from the two, the two Billy Billion YouTube chats. Okay. Maybe I, I add a kind of a observation, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Um, so, interestingly enough, uh, I think we see uh, four projects in the first part of the presentations, which are all um, in different scales and different domains of design. One is, in, one is about conception, so the, the project by Fernando. Another one is about space, maybe the project from Uni Michigan. Another one is about matter, uh, the project by Patrick. And another project uh, from the UCLA IDEA campus is about city. So uh, it is interesting that how AI is basically um, addressing different scales. So one question maybe open to all participants is how we can basically shift gears from dif different scale, from one scale to another scale. And I think this is a, a maybe a, a general question of the application of AI in, in architecture. Do we can we can we think of a, a sort of a super intelligence or general AI in, in architectural design? If yes, uh, how that would happen? Um, I mean, maybe maybe that's a that's a question that maybe many who are outside the field of outside from the field of uh, computation and AI in architecture would would like to ask. Uh, can we think of a general AI? And if yes, how we can uh, benefit from basically shifting gears from one scale to another scale? from matter to space, from conception to city, so on and so forth. I have an answer for that, but I'll wait for someone else to answer. Maybe, yeah. I can, I can maybe, so, so I think this is an interesting idea, of course, much more general than, than the specific presentation. I think uh, uh, the most valuable way I see people thinking about this right now is what, what they call AI generating algorithms. So is this idea of like, which kind of connects to what we saw, the generative aspects of what we saw is, is the idea of diverge, divergence and novelty. So the idea is that you could reach there by having some sort of algorithm that you would never want to stop. So that, that's, I'm quoting Ken Stanley here. So and he says, nature is such an algorithm. So after billions of years, it's still producing like wonderful things, right? So, so that, that is kind of like the way and the, the stepping stone story that I see is these experiments where the algorithm or the agent or whatever it is, is being trained on uh, consecutive experiments that are more complex. Step by step, they increase in complexity and eventually they change in, as you said, scale or maybe scope. So this is, this is kind of like you know, an intuition I see from the, not mine, from the AI industry on how that might be addressed. Could, could I just sort of chip in there? I mean, I, I, I wrote, wrote an article for um, Acadia um, a while back. It also appeared in the NAD. Um, uh, the, the, the Acadia one was called Zoom Space and the, the AD one was called, uh, I think Scale Matters, I forget now. Anyway, I think that, that this is really a challenge actually because uh, the, the, uh, in some ways the problem about AI is operating uh, in a kind of representational zone and performance doesn't become enough of an issue. Now, when you scale up, you have real problems um, uh, because you can scale up on a, on a screen and it looks easy. But actually, when you, if you deal with uh, kind of structural issues, um, it becomes more complicated. So you have what De Delanda dis makes a distinction between intensive and extensive. Um, the extensive is what we see, the visual dimension. The intensive is a set of qualities such as stress and so on, which we can't 
see as such. Um, so when you visually scale up, you often lose uh, that other side of things. That's why, for example, you take an ant, which has got spindly legs, and you try and make it larger, you have to have a, an elephant with these sturdy legs because it's not so straightforward. Um, I won't go into that now, but I think this is one of the kind of challenges ultimately uh, with, with AI is how do you deal with the question of performance over the kind of representational side of things. Does anyone else want to make a comment to that, that question? Okay, um, do we have, uh, let's have some more questions. I have a question for the first presentation. I, I, it's a, more, a bit more practical side. So you showed, I think, if I, if I saw it correctly, that uh, the inputs are actually a 3D dimensional array of points, right? The view, the view factor of view, view points, right? I wonder how, did you have any issue with like curse of dimensionality there? Like how did that scale? And did you have to do any, anything to, to manage the algorithm to figure, like, you know, how was scaling these things look like? Because when we go to the scale of actual design, we, we might need much more than computation typically is, is allowed. Yeah. So that's my question. Yeah. Uh, so you're asking about how the AI apply in the urban scale. Uh, I was I was thinking how would it scale in in real uh, sizes. So because you mentioned that you're using the three D array of points. So if this is a million points, in a, so do you have any issues on how to reduce this uh, complexity or like in, yeah, in attempts? Oh, the scale are designed by us manually. The AI is as a tool to tool to generate the CD image for us, and we. The, the site analy analyze and the process of uh, urban designing is made by uh, human intelligence. That's our effort to make the urban planning. So yeah, so AI is just a uh, assisting tool in our project. Uh, actually, I think the project is a combination of uh, human intelligence and artificial intelligence. So the but the question you asked maybe is more about the human intelligence we use. Okay. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah, see that. You also mentioned that uh, you're working uh, with Robert. Uh, so, so uh, Sina, can you get close to the microphone? We, we can't hear someone. Can you hear me? Okay. You yes. mentioned that also you're, you're working on uh, robotic fabrication. How do you see the application of AI and this, uh, this uh, sort of uh, material-driven uh, evaluation using, because, because when you are using photogrammetry, you, you are also having some information with regards to the texture, with regards to the color. So how do you see this, uh, this application of AI can be sort of extended more towards fabrication and materialization? Um, yeah, so I think maybe this will actually lead back to uh, the kind of discussion of um, like efficiency or, or how AI uh, becomes more focused on optimization versus like aesthetics or representation. Um, like what we're doing in the lab currently, uh, obviously the presentation I gave is more focused on like material aesthetics and kind of representational um, methods of machine learning. So we're still keeping some of those as kind of base, like formal or, or generative approaches to it. But then we're just tying in additional like genetic algorithms or additional machine learning processes to, to analyze and then feedback and constrain. So it's, it's always like the design focus on kind of aesthetics and formal generation, but, but then we have separate algorithms that are like developed specifically for fabrication constraints, material constraints, structural constraints, and and those are like then fed back in at that point. Um, but I, I mean, as of now, like they're being developed uh, separately first and then tied in together to kind of then start to negotiate between the two. 
Do you, do you want more specifics on what? No, I'm, 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 I just wonder how, how for instance, because because in, in AI we we deal with a large, uh, let's say, input data set, right? So and then uh, the way we 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 use and basically somehow generate or access this large data set is really uh, important, right? So how how how. You, how can we benefit from a large data set in, in fabrication and materialization? Maybe this is my question. Or how do you see it? Um, I mean, I, I guess you can see it in, in a lot of ways, but, but I guess the, the easiest is like, you just benefit it, benefit uh, through any like potential real time application or something like a machine being able to in real time uh, respond to a diverse, like set of uh, sensors or, or whatever it is. Um, so, so, I mean, the larger the data set, uh, the more robust the processes are, the um, you know, more varied uh, responses to some detected or like sense data um, that come from it. But I mean, in terms of specifics, like for, like for, for my project, uh, the photogrammetry is just making this type of like data collection more readily available. So I think another thing that we're focused on is using that as a feedback tool to uh, construct things like it would be it additive manufacturing or or some other method of robotic construction, uh, constructing things and then scanning those back in and then using that. Uh, like I mentioned, that becomes the kind of feedback into the original generative process. Um, so less so maybe about like the size of the data set, but more about the specifics on like what you're actually able to produce as a data set a and like the time in which you're able to do that. Obviously photogrammetry now is like happening quick enough that, that it's nearly real time. Like you can nearly interface uh, Kind of on that real time feedback level, um, mm -hmm. and then adjust the out, like adjust the machine learning process and the fabrication response. Thank you, Marina. I know you had a question. Do you want to, to ask your question? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm, I'm Marina from Argentina, just in case, uh, because nobody knows me. But uh, I. Um, I just want to make a question. Um, my question is focusing the role of uh, architects in the context of AI. I strongly believe that uh, we need to rethink the relation between technology, environment, and creativity. But far from the blind devotion uh, to technology as we experienced in the past. Uh, and I think that architecture has a lot to give. Uh, architecture is a projective action and as architects we work with time and time as a part of a process is not the, the merely transfer or, or the merely representation of a style uh, and we should think uh, ourselves uh, far from the automatic process that uh, lead us to the routinization routinization of the invention so I think uh, architecture is potency and is active and at the same time, uh, okay, as Neil said, uh, said in the, uh, his article, matter matters. And I want to add that matter still matter. So I would like, in a way, just to go to the, to the question, uh, I would like to refer to Peter Eisman's question, where he's an architect. And my question could be, what do you think that is an architect in the age of AI? So it's a general question. Uh, that's, just, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a that's a hard question. I would say maybe. I I, maybe I think I think in in terms of oh yeah, go on. You go. Uh, just briefly, like uh, maybe less of what what is an architect, as in like what our role is, but more I think uh, sometimes it's misconstrued that like the AI is uh, taking too much or all of like our role. But I think we're most most of us would be first and like foremost designers uh, and we want to maintain 
at least some of the agency. Um, so, I mean, I think it more becomes a question of like, how is AI used uh, in a way that it's like either optimizing for efficiency? Is it, is it reducing material use or reducing time? Is, is it like doing intelligent, uh, it's making intelligent solutions for us? Um, or like, I, I mean, my project wasn't focused on that uh, today that I presented, but, but uh, even the, the work that I was presenting, um, I'm not suggesting that it would ever design, uh, you know, on my behalf, um, but I think it's a nice generative process that now instead of uh, using the original precedent set, I can now supplement uh, new generative outputs within that precedent set. So it starts to encourage more creativity within that. Um, and then, yeah, like, so it can kind of be a generative tool and uh, an efficiency tool. Maybe maybe I can add to that, like maybe maybe like uh, 20 years ago when, when, when a computation in architecture and education was about like, yes, let's look into the mathematics and like topology and geometry. And then 10 years ago was about like, yes, let's also be a roboticist. Maybe, maybe today we, we also need to be system engineers, right? Like being able to uh, construct systems which are well, well developed and there are basically subsystems within this larger system that are well connected. And I think, again, architects are there because when we want to shift gears again from one scale to another scale, or when we want to have a, a sort of intention, like the other day I, I was in a presentation by some uh, fellows from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, they were also looking into like application of AI in, in, uh, in, in city planning. And then uh, at one point they were saying, okay, we want a, a kind of downtown like uh, region within this uh, zone, right? So this an intention is, is sort of uh, there. Uh, this is something that maybe we cannot expect the, the, the machine or AI to to have that sort of intention. So I think that the nature of the discipline is sort of changing, but at the same time, we, we can say, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not this fan, a fan of this idea that like AI is going to take over or robots are going to take over because this is not the case. It's, it's only about like how we can extend our knowledge to be able to be in charge, basically. I mean, maybe I can just add something. I think there's a there's a there's a, a broader shift that's already happened in some ways. Uh, when you think about the, the opera, uh, kind of algorithmic operations, in a way, there has been a shift that's happened. The, the old-fashioned idea of kind of uh, the kind of master architect imposing form on the world has given way to a, a kind of the architect becoming in charge of processes. You know, in a way, it's almost like the creativity of an architect now is about the creativity of establishing a kind of search space um, of running the algorithm, um, looking at the outcomes, and then um, uh, finding a way of analyzing or evaluating those outcomes, which is very different to the, to the old fashioned idea that I was brought up with, where it all came out of the, the architect's kind of mind in a sense. So it's, there's, there's already that kind of shift. Uh, I, I personally, I don't have the confidence that seems Cena has that, that actually we won't be displaced at some point by AI, but um, eventually. But I think for the moment, we're obviously in a very different sort of uh, domain. Typically, people talk about this in terms of extended intelligence, whereby the AI becomes a kind of prosthesis to the human imagination. And I also like the uh, the reference that um, that Michael Hansmeier does, to the, the idea that, that, that AI is a kind of news, that kind of, the, that kind of throws up these possibilities um, that inspire us and allow us to take it further. So I think there's kind of, it's a very kind of hybrid condition, but I think it's going to be shifting over time. Um, and uh, I don't think AI was the start of this. It's already begun and it's going to lead to something very different. Um, yeah, I think this leads me to, to something that um, I wanted to ask um, about everyone um, in in terms of the body and embodied experience um, of the world and how we as architects, um, you know, are also people inhabiting space. And the question I have is um, in collaboration with AI, um, how do you see something that is intrinsically without a body helping us design for embodied experiences of the environment? So 
actually basically like what do you think in in the future will happen when we work with um ai or right now machine learning deep learning algorithms that don't have a body um what do you think will happen to us with our bodies you know um in that connection are we learning from them are they learning from us um i just wanted to throw this in the mix because the body is still something that's very uniquely human um so what what is what is your vision of that i don't want to uh <laughs> keep talking but uh a quick response. Uh, it's interesting that the reinforcement learning with uh, Unity's like agent ML uh, processes are taking off a little bit more recently um, in that it echoes a lot of body responses to environments, uh, or at least some of the, the papers I've seen utilizing that. Uh, so I don't know, like, I, I agree with you in a lot of ways. Uh, I think it's interesting, but, but it, to think that actually we're now constructing AIs that do mimic some bodily functions in space, like maybe to accommodate for that, I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess just to piggyback kind of on um, that response, I think that, you know, if, if you look at how human bodies interact with the environment, we're essentially transducing uh, energy into sensory, you know, sensory inputs. And so, in effect, you know, if we supply neural networks or AIs uh, with these sensory inputs or, you know, dynamic models of how bodies move through space, um, which is sort of what Google um, Deep uh, Mind is doing, uh, which I think is the body kind of uh, the presence of body learning how to walk in environments and whatnot, um, you know, in, in theory, we can, I think, still maintain sort of that human uh, physicality. Uh, but that's sort of I mean, maybe that's a very engineering, you know, kind of approach to it. Uh, but I think, you know, as long as the sensory information is there, uh, we can use it in the training process of these uh, AI systems. Uh, I want to say something, but um, first I want to make sure if uh, the visual, I mean, if the voice in my voice is okay because I'm doing the live stream. I yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay my. Um, yeah, briefly, my answer is that, okay, the body probably has two main functions. One is the observer. So we use our bodies to um, observe the environment. For example, if we feel pain. So actually, uh, according to the Benjamin Brighton's, in the future or even currently, the observer, this role of our body has been replaced by the machine who uses several sensors agencies to more precisely to detach uh, the environment um, as we can see many infrastructures as well as many uh, digital sensors uh, and the second main function i would say is that uh, we not censor the environment but we also react to the environment. So if we lost, uh, we lost the role or the function of observing or sensing the environment, how can we interact with the environment? So I think it's a very, it's a quite difficult question. Yeah. Yeah, that was a very- Yeah, maybe, maybe also conceptually, we can think of robotics and AI as, a, as an integrated package. Uh, then then uh, since, uh, since uh, in robotics, we, we have some sort of, uh, um, let, let's say um, body configuration or like pre presence in the space. So it's not purely like uh, bits and digital, conceptually speaking, but also practically speaking, which also goes back to what Alexa is, is mentioning in terms of sensors and actuators. So I think if we, if we could, if we could uh, conceptualize and also implement robotics and AI as one, one complete package in architectural design and production, I think an operation, I think uh, may, maybe we can, we can bring back the, the, the presence of body into, into the process and also into the um, building process. If I, can I just start? I can, ah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Just if starting. I can play. Ah, sorry, sorry, it's a delay. You go, you go. <laughs> so, uh, to to Victoria's point, I mean, uh, uh, I guess Victoria, you're aware of the um, 
Antonio Damasio's um, critique of AI. Uh, Antonio Damasio is a very famous neuroscientist. Um, he recently produced a book called The Strange Order of Things, um, which makes accessible some of his, his notions. And he's interested, I guess, in, in, the problem about AI is there is no feedback um, between ones, between uh, the, the AI and, and the, there's no body there to, to provide that sort of feedback. And that's, that's his line. I mean, he's not anti-AI. Well, he, he started off, he has a background in computation, so he's not antagonistic towards it, but he thinks it's limiting in some ways. Um, <clears throat> I just want to make a couple of points. One is it to say that um, uh, I, I'm wondering to what, a point in, to what extent there is embedded in the data that comes out anyway some understanding of a kind of corporeal existence in the sense that if we already have um, uh, the problem of, of, of bias appearing in, in data in AI, whereby there are certain sort of um, <clears throat> the biases that do with, 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 with human uh, outputs, because are, are we not going to find that question um, also in the case of, we're going to find some kind of physical biases or understanding the world that are already embedded into the, into the data itself. That'd be one, one point. The second point, um, uh, that, that I was going to make was um, to this is to Jane really, and that's to say, well, the, 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 there's no interaction between um, uh, AI and, and, and the, the, the space around it. But actually, when we're designing uh, in the traditional way, just sketching or something, there's also no interaction. So the design world is not really one of any interaction. It's kind of it's just positing a possible sort of world. Anyway, so theatre. No, I think I think it's very related to what you just said. I was going to play a bit devil's advocate, and if we are honest, I don't think our bodily experience of architecture and engineering in the world is very good right now. I can't remember a time I was in an open space floor or maybe in a meeting room that I wasn't cold, I wasn't feel there was there was a glare coming in from the window. Like I don't think that we are currently so good at designing according to how our bodies feel or they should feel in spaces. So I think maybe what I would be looking at, at least at this stage of generative models for architecture would be the body of work going into these models, as Neil said. So what is actually the data that we're feeding them? Because that's what is going to come out. Like, and this relates to another thing that I wanted to mention later, and I can mention later, about novelty and how can we really generate new things with this, you know, with generative models that we saw in the presentations. And, and I, so I think, yeah, this kind of bias that we already have, it might be more important than right now in the first implementations of the technology than if this will lead to a different understanding, let's say, of experience, I think. I, mean, just... yes, I think, sorry, sorry, go on, Neil. Um, no, sorry, I, I just wanted to say, you know, this relates to, um, I think, um, who hasn't seen it yet, um, the interesting uh, conversation between Bernard Stiegler um, and I forgot who, who it was, um, but um, in Digital Futures, Neil Wiggins. Oh yeah, exactly, sorry. Um, and um, I think it's interesting because his, his whole thing is that it's, um, he's talking about tertiary retention, where it's basically an outsourcing of, um, of the human capacity to, to think. So we actually have an extension to us. And so the question is, you know, in what way are we relating to this extension and using this extension and are we um, maybe sometimes, you know, outsourcing too much? Maybe we need to feed back uh, into our system. So kind of having a more, um, you know, meaningful exchange. That's just something um, that he has been talking about. Unfortunately, he, he just passed. Um, uh, but I think it would be interesting how this kind of conversation gets carried on, especially in the, in the um, discussion about architecture and space. I think that's something that's really important about knowledge and uh, perception. Can you something very, very briefly? Uh, and that's to say that I was brought up, you know, when I studied at the University of Cambridge with a kind of the phenomenological tradition. Um, but it was kind of interesting because we all produced, it was a very touchy-feely world. And you know, we were kind of reading Bachelard and things and. Uh, but actually, and, we, and, and everyone was encouraged to produce these kind of smudgy atmospheric drawings about what the space would be like based on this touchy feely approach towards things. But they were all complete fantasies. I mean, they were not actually, they were kind of smudged versions of, of possible realities. Whereas actually what you do get now, and this goes back to Alexa's kind of comment, I think, uh, or someone else's comment, we actually get a more precise way of calibrating and understanding 
uh, our experience of the world through uh, through measuring things through co computationally. So I think in some ways there was a myth of this kind of feedback going on in the past, and maybe it's kind of useful to try and bring these new tools in to try and test that out and take it to a higher level. Um, I want to say that I'm very interested in Bernard Stiegler's theories, and actually I have done quite much research on his theories. And uh, uh, according to what I said previously, that the feedback between the human body and the, the environment, or even with the machine, why I pointed or highlighted the feedback or the interactions between these two objects, the point is that those feedbacks is always a very important uh, uh, key or core for us to train or to develop our perceptions as what uh, previously there is, a, there is a presentation called a deep per perception. And this perception here I mentioned is not the perception of machine, but maybe is that how the machine can help people to enhance or to develop a new kind of a perception. So I just, uh, mm, yeah, here, I just want to say that uh, we need probably to look a little bit of the, the, the potential risk that if we bypass or outsource too much of the thinking or feeling affection process to the machines. So I know it's a little bit away from today's topic, but this is what I wanted to give all of you. Um, and about the body, I think it is related to the uh, previous question, the scale of the of the of our program, and it depends on our thoughts. I think um, architects still need some imagination to um, translate this information to architecture component. Um, so that might be our work in the future, and uh, in that way, I think AI could be a different way of um, approaching design. Tony, well, what... Yeah, if I can jump in here, uh, well, not not so strictly related to this question, but um, also connecting to this question, I guess uh, um, probably the human scale of architecture is obviously uh, something that is connected to the evolution that architecture had throughout history. And if we try to uh, look at it uh, from a computational point of view, uh, it seems to me that uh, architecture evolved with, a, uh, with millions of millions of discriminators that are the users who, who leave the architecture and that where the, those who controlled the adaptation of the dimensions and all the elements you know, throughout history. Uh, and perhaps then the data set that resulted from that history is the one that is now training this, uh, these processes. But anyway, uh, as a parenthesis to this, actually I wanted to ask uh, another question to Patrick again, um, and we, in relationship to a concept that uh, was mentioned last week and later in the forum by Alessandro Mintrone, uh, specifically in reference to the dichotomy between discrete and continuous, uh, he was referring to concepts, but uh, in relation, in ref reference to human and artificial intelligence. Uh, but of course, I think it, it's it's quite banal, but but meaningful to um, to consider the difference between discrete and continuous uh, detail in formal resolution. No. So that's why I, I thought it was uh, extremely fascinating to see the exercise of training um, the GAN with the data set uh, of human designs, like these objects, ceramics from Art Nouveau, that are among the objects designed by humans are the ones that have very little uh, quantity of discrete hand elements in the form of resolution. Now, there's a lot of... Uh, at a certain point, continuous detailing, no? And, and therefore, when you when you showed us the result, I was uh, mind blown by how realistic they were, how credible they were, no? As a, as a human discriminator, I was completely fooled. For me, they could be real ceramics from uh, the late 19th century. And therefore, um, so if I understand correctly, you later have run 
with that data set, the same process on buildings in Philadelphia. Is that correct? And that they have a lot of discrete uh, formal component and discrete uh, um, elements in the, in the formal resolution. And so I wanted to ask you how different it was to work with the, on these two very different methods in terms of uh, formal detailing with that uh, data set and with that, uh, you know, machine learning. Yeah, but part of my approach, I mean, the initial approach was, uh, the, my first response was to flatten like everything and say kind of, okay, uh, you know, how, how the architects of the era approach their building detailing and how the ceramicists approach uh, their kind of crafting of their ceramics to, to flatten it so that you can kind of uh, start to find similarities between even, even those things. Um, but then as it's applied to like the actual building, um, that, that's where the conditional GANs, like the, the fact that it already has a reference at a specific scale, as you increase the scale of the semantic label and, and like increase its complexity, um, then you start to increase the formal output and, and like that complexity. <clears throat> so, I mean, I found it relatively fluid uh, in terms of like training on the objects first and then moving towards the building because it had the building to respond to. Um, so I guess the process of kind of deconstructing the object into uh, the, the layers I showed, so like all of the mesh data basically, um, but first extracting that, uh, then when you go to put it back on an existing uh, piece of content, so like a building scan, it already has windows and door frames and other features that, that the GAN can start to respond to in order to generate uh, multiple scales across the whole facade. And also uh, the, the vector displacement GAN just does like kind of larger moves on the facade. So that was an issue, the kind of discrete continuous negotiation between those and the like object uh, and, you know, kind of multi-scale uh, of objects at the facade level um, w was an issue to negotiate. Um, but, but then, I, I mean, I used, uh, where the project was at the time, I used the style transfer networks to kind of supplement that to add more localized uh, detailing and features. Because obviously the way that those work are, is they like kind of propagate the, the features throughout the image. Um, so, using the strengths of both networks to kind of create the output that it did. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answered <laughs> or, or is a complete enough response. Yeah, yeah I think it does. Thank you. Yeah, just let me, I, I, I could say something because I'm, I'm one of the skeptics about that. When, when I, whenever I hear the word discrete, I always get very worried. I, I think along with Sanford Quinter, I'm very suspicious of this thing. But I, what I would say is that it's in some ways, there's no absolute thing such as a discrete. It's all a kind of relative um, notion. So, for example, things that we consider continuous, like let's say the, the planet Earth, well, if you zoom out far enough so it becomes a kind of speck in the in the in, in the Milky Way or in the solar system, it becomes a street, discrete object. So it's it's a, it's kind of it's it's you have to take into account some kind of relational capacity. There's no absolute notion of continuous, nor any absolute notion of the discrete. But that's my that's my particular view. <laughs> Uh, can I, can I, uh, there's a question, a couple of questions in the, in the chat that I'd like to ask um, from Emiliano. Um, this is a question to Alexa. Um, I'm wondering what kind of human agencies are trying to be divorced from architecture morphologies and what is earned by that? Um, not, yeah. Um, so hopefully uh, I can answer that question. Uh, I will admit that uh, I, so I always end up taking more of an engineering approach to uh, these things because that's my background. Uh, but I think what we kind of the key element of, uh, you know, when us, like a human sits down um, to design something, you know, there is a myriad number of priors that are involved in that, that, you know, uh, stem from sort of education, from uh, life experience. And the beauty of neural networks is that they learn very quickly from large data sets of images, um, but they can only learn the information that's contained within those data sets. 
Um, and so there are none of these kind of same priors that neural networks um, necessarily are influenced by. And so that really is kind of what motivated sort of our, our use of these algorithms um, to kind of explore ways um, that, you know, we can represent visual information in the design process or kind of, you know, represent uh, sort of these little atoms of design, I would say, or atoms of visual information, you know, that are very different than what we as humans would necessarily pick out. Um, and so I think, I mean, that for me kind of has been the main um, line of inquiry and I hope that it sort of gets at answering that question. Okay, can I, there's another question here um, also from the chat um, from Asvaldo Ariel Almendra. Um, <clears throat> And the question is, in terms of technology and technological capacity, in brackets, and also in design capacity, close brackets, how do projects work with the notion of noise, in brackets, understood as a technological error or low resolution level? Do we recognize this? Do we ignore it? How do you work with it? Shall I repeat this? It's quite a long question. In terms of technology and technological capacity, also in the, in the design capacity, in design capacity, how do projects work with the notion of noise understood as a technological error or low resolution level? Do we recognize this? Do we ignore it? How do you work with it? I think our design process is always with the error and noise. And that it's also about our machine learning process is uh, with, the, uh, with the problem with uh, about uh, low resolution and so on. But I think that because the machine experiences the world in a very rational way, so we need some for we need some space for us to uh, add some inspiration and emotion into the design. So I think we could uh, deal with the error, the noise like that. Any other comments on that? On that? I think I think for in, in terms of. The generative models, I think noise is, is crucial and is necessary in many aspects. One, one way is because it's one of the most common ways to keep a generative capacity for these models is to add noise to your input in order to have, as someone I think mentioned in one of the presentations, in order to not memorize and generalize better. So noise is a sort of like valuable input for these models. And also in truly generative models, it's actually the input. So we can input noise and get out a design or some sort of shape or whatever. So, so I think it's a core part of the world. Yeah, just to add on to that in the context of generative models, um, the input noise is really important in capturing the probabilistic nature of the world. And so, um, for example, with um, StyleGAN2, which is one of the models that um, Patrick mentioned in his presentation, um, the noise is actually used to not only enforce that the network is using uh, or is learning a distribution over possible, a, pro a probabilistic distribution over pro possible uh, visual styles, but it's also um, used uh, as a way to um, mimic really high frequency information. And so, for example, in the original StyleGAN2 paper, it was actually uh, trained on a data set of faces. And so they demonstrated that the high, um, that the noise input actually was allowed them to model changes in hair to changes in freckles, you know, to capture kind of that very uh, important, uh, you know, those small but important details uh, that we see in kind of uh, the real world. Uh, so yeah, noises uh, can be very useful for us in kind of capturing the, the stochasticity of real life. So, um, <clears throat> do we have any further questions? I, I've got one very specific question for Alexa. Uh, um, you, you, I, I'm interested in what your actual research is in your PhD. I know you've been collaborating oh. with, the, with the Taupin School of Architecture. What is your actual research in, in your PhD itself? Um, so, I work with the Ford Autonomous Vehicle Lab at the University of Michigan. And uh, my thesis research specifically looks at how you can encode physical models of the real world into deep learning processes. Um, and so some of my work has looked at how, 
you know, the uh, effects of the sensor devices used to collect data or image data, uh, such as, you know, with RGB cameras, how noise uh, of, you know, the physics of that process actually deteriorates visual information and how neural networks uh, actually can overfit to that type of noise, <laughs> that camera noise. And so um, I look at ways of uh, trying to mitigate uh mitigate those effects. Um, because what we see is that with each data set that we use to train neural networks on, whether they're for object detection or for uh, classification or whatnot, that again, it kind of gets a, this idea of data set bias where it only, its sense of the world is only what is contained in that data set. So for example, if it only knows um, a specific exposure level because of the data set, uh, the camera that was used to capture the data set, then when it it can't generalize to other data sets um, with cameras that had different exposure levels. And so um, a lot of the research I do is looking at designing methods uh, that sort of model that uh, information uh, within images as a way to improve uh, training of neural networks. Maybe I can ask you this other question, um, Alexa, just because I, I um, what Fernando was showing, um, in his project, how you could train a neural network on buildings. Um, and uh, it would then read buildings into everything. It would read you know, tower blocks into someone's wardrobe into the tie and thing. Um, uh, I just wonder what you, what you, from your background, would think of, 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 of that, the, the, the project that Fernando showed, Fernando Salcedo, of reading architecture, architecturalizing the world, as it were, um, as someone from outside architecture. Um, I think it's really cool. And it kind of, uh, you know, for me, I actually started out in neuroscience when I was an undergrad. And so moving into artificial intelligence, it's fun to sort of see certain, certain neuroscientific theories kind of being confirmed by these toy models of the human brain. And I, I do really want to stress that neural networks are very, very much toy models of how the human brain works. Um, partially and because, you know, they don't necessarily model a sense of dynamics and time and whatnot. But I think what's cool is that we see, you know, pareidolia kind of that effect of, you know, when we train neural networks to do certain tasks or to extract certain things from our environment, they mimic kind of that human ability to see, you know, to see those things within the environment. And so a great example of this is actually with Google Deep Dream, which is something that Neil Seth experiments with a lot, uh, is that when we utilize uh, these network visualization techniques to kind of, uh, you know, understand what neural networks have learned to extract from their environment, um, it looks like, you know, kind of how, well, how the human brain operates when it's under, um, uh, psychedelic, uh, the influence of psychedelics. And so it supports this idea that, you know, we, as humans, um, you know, we are always seen, or um, we kind of, you know, both with neural networks and with humans, with these information processing uh, networks, you know, we're, we are, we're so heavily influenced by priors from our, you know, from what we've been exposed to. And I think that uh, that's kind of, it's always important to remember that. And, you know, as designers, we can really take advantage of that by designing data sets like with, you know, the buildings, like where, you know, no matter what your input, it's always going to map until this into this building space. Or, you know, we've experimented around in our studio um, with looking at training classification networks on different types of building styles like Gothic and Baroque and trying to hallucinate Gothic and Baroque architecture into other buildings. So we're looking for patterns that, you know, our brains will complete to, or like the neural networks, quote unquote, brain will complete to. And so I think that kind of, kind of again gets us at this idea where neural networks can have similar ways of seeing the world that we as humans do, but they also can have very different ways of seeing the world. I, I, that's, I, I, I always find it fascinating how you get this overlap between neuroscience and AI. I mean. Demis Sabis, I think he did, a, he did a PhD in, in neuroscience before going on to AI, and someone like Anil Seth, you must know him very well, uh, is, did a PhD in AI before going on to neuroscience. So let me ask you a, a final question in that exercise. I don't want to pest you too much, but are you interested in, in artificial intelligence or intelligence? Um, <laughs> I... I feel like I'm cheating if I say both. Um, I, I mean... 
I think in studying artificial intelligence, you're also studying intelligence in general. Um, and I think what is key with artificial intelligence is that it really pushes us to question our definition of intelligence as related, you know, because I think the way that we as humans define intelligence is very much relative to our own experiences. You know, it's a very human definition. And I think with artificial intelligence, you know, we can start thinking of, you know, new forms of intelligence. And so, you know, while it can be very useful and fruitful to examine human intelligence as a way to understand artificial intelligence and vice versa, um, I do think that, you know, we, it kind of is sort of, it allows us, you know, studying artificial intelligence allows us to expand that idea, you know, that notion of what, what is intelligence or what is possible with an information processing system. So you think we're too human centric in, in the way we approach AI? In some well, sense. I mean, there, I think there can be, well, so for me, I mean, specifically with regard to autonomous vehicles, um, I think it can be very dangerous to use terms like learning and neurons and understanding because, you know, in neuroscience, we're not necessarily even sure what learning and how learning and understanding happens in our own networks. And so when we start using these terms to describe what algorithms are doing, um, it kind of I mean, the quick and easy thing to do, you know, is if I hear, you know, I have my own sense from my own experiences with learning, you know, we have the potential to misattribute that the same processes that are going in and on in our brains are going on in algorithms. And that's completely false. Um, and I think this kind of leads to this fear of AIs taking over is because people will read articles about, you know, I think my favorite one was the Bob and Alice experiment from Facebook, where the way it was reported was that two neural networks learned their own language and Facebook had to shut them off. When in fact, what happened is that the loss function was not formulated in the correct way. And so these two networks, instead of learning English, ended up learning sort of like a Morse code version of it. You know, so it was a failed experiment. It wasn't that, you know, there was any sentience that was actually gained uh, or, you know, that these networks uh, were able to kind of get to. Uh, but yeah, so I think, you know, it's, but it's hard though, because we also, you know, we're constricted by our own uh, language. So, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting area for that reason. <laughs> but uh, I do think that there are some, you know, some misgivings, oh, well, I, I, I should say I have misgivings about using to, or relying too much on psychology and sort of human centric ways of understanding these things. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> no, that was a fantastic answer. I mean, just to say that these, the, all these, I'm going to go back and, and, and listen to that again. All these uh, sessions are going to be up on, on YouTube. Um, so you can consult them if any of them, were, if the descriptions were too dense, you can go and play them to cage yourself later on. Um, let's have some more questions. So, um, Anything from the, the YouTube one um, or from the Billy Billy? Okay, we can probably um, <clears throat> wrap things up at this, this point. Just to say, uh, but just go back, anyone missed the very beginning. Um, we, there are two uh, um, slight changes to the schedule that we're proposing. But basically what we're proposing is, is every single Saturday uh, at the same time, we will have um, an event um, and uh, uh, we're working our way through the, 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 the topics, the themes of um, digital futures world in terms of subject areas. Um, we started with AI. Uh, we're going to slightly shift things because we're going to um, uh, bring in computational design, which is probably one of the, well, it was most of the, the workshops we're, we're dealing with that, that field. So next we'll rather than go alphabetically through, we, we won't do AR next, we'll do computational design next. And we'll be issuing a call for submissions for, for that um, in the next few days. But next Saturday, um, we're actually going to uh, be bringing in instructors. And this is the other slight change we're making. In the first, when we did AI, we brought the instructors for the AI workshops to talk about their, their AI workshops. We thought actually probably more interesting to get the instructors to talk about their own particular kind of work. So next Saturday, we've got a really amazing lineup of, of individuals who will be um, presenting their research work. Um, and, and importantly, we, we didn't, we're not going for the big names. So 
many of the people who taught on Digital Futures World are quite famous. Um, uh, people like I don't know, Roland Snooks or, or um, um, uh, Jill Retzin or Mark Burry or, or Elisa Andrushek and so on. We're not going for the so, so, so much the big names as, as going for the, the, the younger generation who are not so well known. Um, so as to bring them out and, and believe you me, some of them are very talented. So it's, uh, I think it's the idea of this platform is to really expose ideas that are being developed both among um, the students and also among the instructors. So we're going to have this kind of continuous session going on week by week. Um, and then at some point, we'll maybe be introducing a few uh, into this kind of landscape, we're going to be introducing a few other uh, bigger events. But basically, um, uh, we'll be here each Saturday at the same time. Um, do we have any final comments coming in from, uh, from the, the Digital Futures Young Committee? I think the, the submission due for the 15th that Virginia is mentioning that we need to mention that uh, we have a due date for the 15th for the computational design, I think. Um, I, I, the 15th is going to be the instructors, right? So the actual su submissions are going to be for the following week. Is that right, Virginia? Uh -huh. We, anyway, we, we're going to be everything will be we posted on the the Digital Futures website. There's also a Discord channel where there's a um, a kind of side debate going on, as it were, um, and you can access the Discord channel by um, uh, uh, going onto the Digital Futures World website and going from there. But you know, it's it's so just to clarify. You're yes, the call for submissions is open um, right now. We have posted it on our social media. If you need a link, there's a Google form to fill out. Um, you can also email info at Digital Futures World if you can't find that link, but it is on our website. It's on our social media platforms. Um, and the submissions will be due uh, next week on the 15th, um, right around this time at noon um, Eastern Standard Time and at midnight in Shanghai time. Um, and that will be calling for presentations on the 22nd and on the 29th of August. So we're hoping that you'll submit and that you, we will be able to see your presentations up here on those dates. Fabulous. So just to kind of repeat that, the 15th, that's next Saturday, will be some of the instructors showing their work. And then the 22nd and the 29th will be presentations by uh, Digital Futures Young um, uh, from the submissions that are due next Saturday. Um, okay. Uh, let's let's wrap things up. I just want to thank um, uh, the presenters today. That was actually really an, a really interesting conversation. Um, I also want to present uh, thank uh, the team that's been putting this together behind the behind. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of hard work goes on behind putting this together. I'd like to thank the the new committee coming in, the Digital Futures Young Committee, um, and I look forward to our discussion um, next Saturday when we'll be dealing with instructors working on computational design. So thank you everyone and uh, thank you everyone. See you guys next week. Thank you. Thank, thanks thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks Bye. everyone. Bye. Come, Bye. come by the Discord channel. <laughs> come come and discuss with us. Bye. <laughs>